God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit promised to be with us. Our mindset, come and see. We welcome you to Agape. We're glad you're here. Over the mountain, over the mountain, through the deep end. Don't you know that Jesus has said, I, well, the Lord said, I'm never going to say, oh, Lord, that's the promise, divine word, promise that never can fail, oh, oh, heavenly, heavenly. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Place Where It Is Written. My name is Lakeisha Douglas, and I am one of the members and Bible teachers uh, of the Sisters classes here at Agape Church of Christ in Fresno, Texas, where Brother Brethren A. Freeman is the ministering evangelist. As students of the Word, it is important that we learn to speak where the Bible speaks and to remain silent where it is silent. We have the example in the scriptures in Luke 4, verses 16 and 17, that Jesus, when asked to lead in worship, he opened the book and found the place where it is written. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Place Where It Is Written. And so today, you'll see I have two wonderful guests beside me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have uh, Brother Burrow, and Brother Freeman, and Brother Burrow is the ministering evangelist from um, Needville Church of Christ in Needville, Texas. Amen. And Amen. so today I have a question for both of you fine gentlemen, and um, I'll go ahead and present it. So, Brother Freeman and Brother Burrow, the Bible says in Isaiah 62, verses 1 and 2, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a light that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name with the mouth of the Lord shall name. Which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Excuse me. All right. So based on these scriptures, can you gentlemen go to the book and find the place where it is written that demonstrates the significance of the name of the church? And does it really matter what we call ourselves religiously? Well, I tell you, uh, Sister Lakeisha, it's just a pleasure to have Brother Vern with us this morning. Uh, this question is so very compelling because what it does, it highlights for us the importance of following after the mandates and the directives of the Lord. When we read this prophecy from the book of Isaiah, it showcases for us the overarching vision of God Almighty and how in dealing with this truly foreordained plan of salvation and ultimately redemption of mankind. See, it foreshadows the gospel being proclaimed to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And look carefully how Isaiah prophesies this. Before the collective group of combined believers would be called by a new name, the Gentiles would be exposed to the word of God. The Jews surely had the gospel preached to them first. Uh, and then ultimately, the Gentiles. And then the Lord says in prophecy, they should be called by a new name. Now the Bible declares this in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, where the book says they were called, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, truly, there is great speculation and some controversy among many scholars and theologians, and Brother Vern, no doubt, can speak to this as well, as to whether or not the terminology or the word Christian was first introduced and cast upon the followers of Jesus as a derogatory term intended and introduced by their enemies of the cross or did the early disciples in fact coin this term themselves in their association with Jesus Christ now regardless of the origins of the term either from the enemies or the followers of Christ 
The Bible attests to the fact that behind it all was the Father, God the Father. For Isaiah says it was the name that the mouth of the Lord would name. Now, we lay that foundation. So this is akin to when Moses goes before Pharaoh and God tells him, I'm sending you back to Egypt. Here's the message. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, it's very interesting when we read in Exodus 4, and verse 21, that God warned Moses that I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, when you read that, my friends, you might come away confused. You might be saying within yourself, well, if the Lord is going to harden his heart, then Pharaoh doesn't have a chance. And it just doesn't seem fair. But what is it that hardened Pharaoh's heart? Now, keep in mind the foundation I'm laying behind the Jews having the word of God preached to them, the Gentiles having the word of God preached to them, and then this new name would come. God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Then he says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, my friends, Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the exact same message that God gave to the Israelites. The message was simply this, let my people go. The message that broke the will of Pharaoh and sent him crashing to the ground was the same message of hope that freed the Israelites. Remember, my brothers and sisters, remember my visiting friends, that the same boiling water that will harden an egg will soften a potato. Mm -hmm. So it's not the, the water, it's the element. It's what you're made of. So when Pharaoh heard that message, it hardened his heart. Yeah. He didn't want to hear, let my people go. When the Israelites heard that message, it freed their heart, it, liber it, it liberated them, it gave them the avenue whereby they were going to be rescued. But when Pharaoh heard that, he didn't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And so that message is what hardened his heart yeah. when it comes to the name or the identifier of the Lord's church. Bert, give us your understanding. Now many are surprised to learn that the Lord's church doesn't really have a specific name. It rather has identifiers and things that classify it uh, and identify it in regards to his relationship. Give us a word or two, uh, Vern, along those lines. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting here that uh, I want to add one thing. Pharaoh uh, was hardened, his heart was hardened, and it was hardened to demonstrate God's power. That's why he rose, uh, why Pharaoh was in, in power. Pharaoh had the, the strongest army, uh, the best chariots, you know, war chariots, and yet here is, like a better term, a, a group of slaves that more or less he's been shown up on. You know, so uh, God, God can do what God wants to do, and He wants to save His people. He sent Moses to do it, true enough. But back to the, the name, uh, it's interesting if you go. Uh, I think there's like 114 different names if you uh, look at all of them that the church is called. And, uh, like this particular congregation, the Gopi Church of Christ. It's a identifying mark. It's a Gopi. tells you whose church it is and who's, who's the head. Christ is the head of the church. Mm -hmm. This is part of the local body. And we make up we make up the church. It's like Nebula, a local body. A Gopi, there's lots of other that make up the church. But uh, in uh, Matthew 16 18, which is well-known verse, uh, Jesus there makes a statement that I'll build my church. So we know whose church it is, and we know also that he's the head of that church. Uh, in Acts 8, 1, it's called the church of Jerusalem. Uh, in 9, 31, it's the churches in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. And by the way, Samaria was Gentile area. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's the early church. Uh, it's simply called the church in uh, Acts 11 26. Uh, church in Antioch, as you already mentioned, uh, Acts 20 and 28, uh, it's uh, the church of God. Uh, and of course, uh, Romans 16 16, 
at Churches of Christ, which is where we get our name. And actually, and, and I'm so glad that you again brought those particular points up as we we're going to go down further, even in the answering of this question. There are a couple of passages of scriptures that I'd like to have uh, Vern to read for us. I'm going to get to that momentarily. As I su was suggesting, it, it's interesting for individuals to learn that the Lord's Church, as Brother Vern is suggesting there and intimating, doesn't have a specific name. Rather, as I said, it has various descriptive terms, terms that highlight specific aspects of a relationship that the Lord maintains with the church. Think about it like this. Similar to the way I have various identifiers, various titles or names, if you will, that signify the various relationships that I have. I bear the name husband, father, brother, uncle, cousin. Graylin is my given name. Andrew is my middle name. Freeman is my surname. I bear the title coach, teacher, preacher, minister, counselor, artist. I can honestly answer to any one of those particular identifiers, any one of those particular names, and they all ring true. They speak about a relationship that I have with someone else. So to our Lord, he maintains various relationships with his called out group of believers. Brother Vernon, in his lesson this morning, he was preaching to us and talking about, uh, about aspects of this. I'd ask Brother Vernon, open the book, Brother Vernon. Let's find the place where it is written. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And let's look at verses 4 and 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Now, this particular passage of Scripture is going to help us to understand these names, how they signify a relationship that the Lord describes. So when we think of Christ as king, when we think of Christ as king, then we can read of his followers as being part of the kingdom of God. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says what, Brother Vernon? Verse 4, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God, for you steadfastly, steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. And did you note there how he went from the uh, churches of God to the kingdom of God, signifying a relationship? When we see Jesus as king, then truly we're members of the kingdom of God. When we think of Jesus as the head, yeah. then we read of his followers as being members of the body. The, the church then becomes the body. Let's read that. First, let's go to the book. Let's find the place where it is written. First Corinthians chapter 12, Brother Vernon, and verse number 27. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27. What does the Bible say there? 12 verse 27. Mm -hmm. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. As Paul is admonishing and teaching in that 12th chapter of the book of Corinthians. He was talking about the significance of this body. Jesus being the head and we individual members of that body. When we see Christ as the husband, then we read of his followers as being part of the bride or called the bride. Revelation chapter 21 verse number 2. In the Bible the church is identified with various names. Let's, now we read one, then the Brother the Vernon's read it uh, in, in uh, first, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 when he called it the kingdom of God. But let's read again about the church of God. Lakeisha, let's open the book. Let's find the place where it's written. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. Let's see what the Bible says there. Acts 20 and verse 28. And it reads, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And so that we make a distinction, Brother Vernon, and help the audience to understand, because many will read this and say, well, church of God. Mm -hmm. I, I know about the church of God, the church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. But you see, the Bible says here, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Mm -hmm. Brother Vernon, which of the gods, of the Godhead, had blood? 
Jesus Christ. That would have been Jesus Christ, as my good brother points out. Mm -hmm. He shed his blood, and Brother Byrne can tell us that story. When did this guy, the Son of God, shed his blood? Yeah, he went to the cross, crucified on the cross, he shed his blood there. And the Bible is emphatic yes. with this declaration. And so when you read Church of God in the Bible, we're not talking about God the Father, we're talking about God the Son. Because it was God the Son who had blood, who shed his blood. God the Father is spirit, and the spirit has not flesh and blood. The Bible clearly admonishes this. When we think of the designations for the church in the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, she's called the pillar and the ground of truth. Galatians 6 and verse number 10, she's called the household of faith. And as our good brother Vern has pointed out in Romans 16 and verse 16, very clearly, she's identified as the Church of Christ. Each of these names is biblically based and thus is authorized by Scripture. Now, we typically utilize the designation Church of Christ because it leaves no doubt, and this is as brother Vern pointed out, it leaves no doubt as to whom the church belongs to, who, who is the main emphasis within the fabric of the church. Now, the reason that it matters, why we, what we call ourselves religiously, is because, my friends, names identify, yeah. names signify, yeah. names specify. Yeah. There's an old adage that says, and you've heard this before, Brother Vern, there's nothing in a name. Mm -hmm. And individuals will say, a rose by any other name would be just as sweet. Mm -hmm. it, it's very interesting how that philosophy, and that statement was made by Shakespeare, it's very interesting how that philosophy is only employed when it comes to matters of faith and things that pertain to the will and the word of God Almighty. It's viewed extremely different when it comes to man and his everyday dealings. Case in point, if there's nothing in the name, then does it matter whose name is on your uh, monthly or bi-monthly or bi-weekly check that comes to your house? When you get ready to get paid, <coughs> You don't, tell, you don't talk that talk. There's nothing in the name. And it doesn't matter what name you have. Uh, if there's nothing in the name, then why didn't you name your daughter Jezebel? If there's nothing in the name, why didn't you name your son Fido? Because names identify. When you purchase a can of Campbell's chicken soup, you don't expect to find peaches on the inside of that can. Because What's the name on the outside identifies what's on the inside. Speak to us for a moment, Brother Byrne, about how important that concept is, that the name on the outside points to what's on the inside. Yeah. Well, as far as, as, far as the name goes, uh, you said rose, and many times uh, what comes to our thought is a sweet smell of a rose. Uh, we think of our favorite color of rose. And all of those things. Uh, when we think of, of the body of Christ, that's what we think is on the inside of wherever, wherever whoever's assigned that name. You know, uh, if we are the body of Christ, then we we know who's the head. And we're just members of that body. It's like yeah. uh, he he was his body was uh, given for our stead. Uh, so whenever we see the name, it should sort of show associate us with what's on the inside, mm -hmm. as, as you pointed out. But many things, uh, names bring up a, a, a recollection, or a sometimes even a taste in our mouth. Uh, and uh, when we, we think about names, Church of God, or, or uh, the way, and we, we are even called the way. That's what Paul was addressing whenever he was persecuting the church. But we we expect in a name to find out what's uh, what's on the inside. It should tell us of something, be an identifier. Absolutely. Of what, what's, What's there? What's there? Absolutely. And going back to that thought again, if there's nothing in the name, let's open the book, Lucretia. Let's find the place where it's written. Leviticus 19, verse number 12. If there's nothing in the name, then why does the Bible say this in Leviticus 19 and verse number 12? And it reads, And you shall not swear by my name falsely nor shall you profane the name of your God. If there's nothing in the name, why does the scripture encourage us not to profane the name of God? If there's nothing in the name, why does the Bible say in Proverbs 22 and verse number one, 
A good name mm -hmm. is rather to be chosen than great riches. Yeah. Let, let's look at one more. Let, right. Let's read Isaiah 56, Brother Vern. Isaiah 56 and verse number five. And we'll ask the question one last time. If there's nothing in a name, mm -hmm. why does the Bible say what it says in Isaiah 56 and verse number five? Isaiah 56 and verse number five. Verse 55 of Isaiah 56. I will give you, I will give in my house, within my walls, a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. When the Bible says he was going to give to his sons and his daughters within his house and his walls a place and a name mm -hmm. better than that of sons and daughters. Yeah. He's pointing to that name. He's pointing to that name that is above all names. Yeah. He's pointing to that name of significance and power, my friend. He's pointing to Acts chapter 4 yeah. and verse number 12. Yeah. If there's nothing in the name, why does the Bible say, neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I've said it before, we'll say it again. Shakespeare's name is all right in the realm of poetry. Mm -hmm. Bacon's name is all right in the realm of science. Yeah. Aristotle's name is all right in the realm of philosophy. Bill Gates' name is all right in the realm of technology. Mm -hmm. But in matters of faith, mm -hmm. in matters of our relationship with God, yeah. in our ability to honor God, to serve God, to worship God, mm -hmm. to come to God, there's only one name. And that is the name of Christ Jesus, the yes. Lord of glory. Friends, visit with us here at the Agape Church of Christ. It would be our great pleasure to sit down and discuss with you further in greater detail what it means to serve God, what it means to surrender our will to the will of the Father on high. Yes. When you have a, if you're in the Needville area, visit the Needville Church of Christ. Brother Vern would be delighted to sit down and discuss with you again the things that are contained in God's wondrous book divine. As in all things, Lakeisha, let's uh, keep the faith till the last amen. Amen. All right. You want me up? Um, okay, so we are doing something a little different. So we do have some audience members. And before I close, uh, we just want to go ahead and see if there's any questions or anything that's looming that you'd like to present to any of our speakers regarding today's. Oh, wonderful. We've got a sister in the back, Sister Jones. Hey. Just speak nice and loud. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question in regards to the title of the name. Um, a lot of Churches of Christ hold consistent the Church of Christ in their title. However, a lot of a lot of brothers and sisters question the name Agape, which would showcase the love that is shown versus the name of a street or a location. Can you answer, is that a necessary requirement of the title? That is an outstanding question. And as we were pointing out even in the discourse here, names identify, names specify, names help to clarify. When we speak about, um, when we can read about the various congregations within the fabric of the scripture. Go to the book of Corinthians, go to the book of Romans, go to the book of Galatians and Ephesians and Thessalonians and so on and so forth. And every letter is addressed to a specific congregation or the leadership within that particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, we need not stumble over the fact of the church of God at Thessalonica, the church of God at Ephesus, the church of Christ at Antioch or so on and so forth. We are here worshiping in the city of Fresno. The brethren and the leadership and myself have selected and designated the designation agape, emphasizing the aspect of love, emphasizing and putting an emphasis upon that particular location, if you will. The, the idea that love radiates in all of our hearts uh, and make try of striving to make that identification. But the emphasis is not upon that particular component as much as it should be upon our relationship with Christ and Him crucified. So yes. this indeed is the agape church of Christ identified as such, but 
of no major significance or stumbling uh, ground in that particular regard as a simple uh, identifier within the fabric of our relationship. I'd like to, I'd like to add, uh, you know, Please. I actually thought about uh, Agape whenever we were talking about this. He texted me about it. And, uh, you know, the thing, uh, the thing with anybody that's interested in, in attending the church today, I'm going to say we, we, we look at things not exactly the way they were looked at maybe when uh, some of the text was written. And it's a great identifier, I think, uh, of agape is uh, God's love. That's the love that God intended. It's the love that God wants around him. I think it's a great name for a congregation. Uh, like a better word, old school, what's we identify our church of Fresno, the church of Christ of Fresno. Uh, I think, uh, to me, uh, it's more perky, uh, attention getter, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it tells me an identifier that uh, I know this is a church that their name says love. Let's go see. <laughs> Amen. 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 Great Amen. question. All right. We've got another question from the gentleman on the left. So with regards to the, the, <clears throat> the name as we've been discussing, there are uh, several scriptures where Paul references the church of God, and especially 1 Corinthians, uh, as well as even in him, Hebrews 12 and 13, uh, the Bible references the church of the firstborn. Mm -hmm. And so with regards to uh, the church of Christ, as we reference Romans 16, uh, the churches of Christ salute you. Are there any uh, similarities or are there any distinctions that we can draw from those that would give us comfort that our name as the church of Christ uh, is still consistent with scriptures given that we have other uh, scriptural examples of names? And again, another interesting question there. One of the things I was striving to emphasize in the heart of the question is that the church, if you will, and we understand church coming from the Greek term ekklesia, meaning the called out. And so any particular group of individuals can be bearing the identity church. The Republican Party is a group of called out individuals who believe a particular philosophy. And so the Republican Party can be called a church. The Democratic Party, a group of called out individuals who believe a particular standard. And so the Democrats can be called a church, uh, the Boy Scouts of America, or whatever group is called out to a particular standard or a particular set of beliefs and practices can bear that distinction church, because church simply means a called out group of believers who follow a particular standard or pattern or practices. Yeah. When we say church, called out group of Christ, we'll see now that identifies what this called out group is doing. This is the called out group of individuals who are following Christ. There's no confusion. There's no misunderstanding. There's no ill will. There's no misgivings about what this group is doing. What, what, what are they practicing? They are striving to follow Christ Jesus. Yeah. When we look to the scripture, when we go to the place and open the book and find the place where it is written, one of the things we were emphasizing is that the church called our group does not have a specific name, but rather what it has is different identifiers that specify aspects of relationship to God. Yeah. And so we could tear down the sign that says Agape Church of Christ and put up the pillar in the ground of truth. And it would be just as biblical because it, it's identifying an aspect of relationship that this called out group is having. They're holding to the pillar and the ground of truth. Jesus is that truth. He is the way, the truth, and the light. We can put up a sign that says the body and be just as biblically based. We are that group of individuals who are representing the body of Christ Jesus being the head. <coughs> and, and so there are many different identifiers, but the reason why we typically utilize the expression Church of Christ almost exclusively is because therein there's no confusion. Right. Therein there's no misunderstanding. Therein there's no, well, who is that? What, what are they about? What, what, are they, what are they doing in there? Church of Christ. 
that's who we are. Needville is where we are, mm -hmm. or particular location. Therein is the, the difference and the significance behind it. When we think about our denominational neighbors, therein it becomes the problem. They identify themselves with identifiers that the Bible doesn't utilize yes. in relationship to Christ. Yes. And therein is the problem. Yes. We start looking for that which is biblically based. Sister Lakeisha says it when she hosts the show, other hosts of the show, maintain this mantra. Speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent. Let's go to the book, find the place where it is written. And I challenge our audience, I challenge our audience. If you can't find the name of your church in the Bible, Amen. there's a problem. Yes. There's a problem. If you can't find the name and what you identify yourself as, as a follower of Jesus, but I can't find it in the Bible, I've got a problem. And so we ask you, we challenge you, open the Bible, find the place where it's written. Yeah. Then we're to be doing those things that please and honor God. Great question. Great question. Anything else? Kind of go off of what Brother Evans asked when you were saying about the Church of God, we see that in the Bible, but just like you were saying, it also it was purchased with His blood, and who has blood in the Godhead? It was Christ. So I think that that stuck with me when you said that earlier. Yes, absolutely. And again, the question for to make certain that it was heard, because people do stumble over this when they read Church of God, they'll make an affiliation with the Church of God in Christ. Yes. Yeah. Church of God is a biblical name. Church of Christ is a biblical name. Church of God in Christ is biblical within its fabric once it's explained. Here's the problem with the Church of God in Christ as a doctrine and as a teaching. Our friends and loved ones who are members of the Church of God in Christ practice and teach things that the scriptures do not teach. And therein is the problem. So even under the sense of having, quote unquote, the right name, we've got to make certain that we're following the right doctrine. Because just the name on the outside, as you as the first pointed out, doesn't really identify what's on the inside. You've got to come on the inside and see whether or not, whether or not it's so. And this was the marked difference when Paul was preaching and teaching the individuals in the city of Berea and in the people in the city of Thessalonica. And what was the difference there, Vern? Help us. He says there, he caught them more noble. Oh, yeah. Because they did what? They searched the scriptures. How often did they do it, Vern? The Bible says they searched the scriptures daily. And for what reason? So. To see whether or not it was so. And just as we have that biblical truism, search the scriptures. Don't just listen to Vern because he's saying it. Don't just listen to Freeman because he's saying it. Open the book. Find the place where it is written. Yeah. Then you'll know for yourself yeah. if it's thus said the Lord. That's why the individuals in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not those things were so. Amen. 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 All right. Well, this was a great, great session. Uh, today, I think we learned a lot of things because a lot of times people rest on the name Church of Christ. And, and um, we've learned today that scripturally speaking, there's a hundred, about approximately 114 different names that the churches refer to in the Bible. Uh, they've given us, these gentlemen have given us a multitude of names, the Church of God, uh, the Churches of Christ, Kingdom of God, uh, the Church of Antioch, the Household of Faith. So uh, remembering that these names are identifiers, the specific names have identifiers, they identify what Brother Vern said, right? What is on the outside, and finds what's on the inside. So a rose, he said it smells like a sweet rose. It has a sweet smell, a pure identifier. Now if you smell a dill weed and it's called a rose, will you get the same scent? <laughs> I doubt it, right? And so the same thing, he talks about the characteristics, that the name is associated with the characteristics. And when you bear the name of a Christian, we know that, that we possess certain characteristics inside that speak to our Christianity and whose we are. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one thing that outside of what Sister Marcy said about explaining the church of God in Christ, 
that was astounding. But another thing is, uh, and I want to leave everybody with this in close, when your check is cashed, figuratively and spiritually speaking, whose name do you want it to bear? All right. All right, so we've had a good one today, guys. So thank you, Brother Freeman. Thank you, Brother Vern, Brother Burrow, for uh, that word and the scriptures and the reference for today's lesson and the place where it is written. I want to thank our listening audience today. And uh, I'd like to thank those that participated in the questions. Um, and I'd like to thank those who are watching this broadcast. Play it, replay it, research it. Again, usually, as usual, I have three pages of notes. But I'm going to go back and read, and I encourage you to do the same. Um, please, uh, please subscribe to, we've got so many avenues now, guys. We've got the Facebook, we've got Instagram, we've got YouTube. Um, subscribe to everything that we have on Place Where It Is Written. You can share it. It's on our website. And also, if you're worshiping within the Houston metropolitan area or you're visiting Fort Bend County, Needville Church of Christ is in Needville, Texas. We've got Agape Church of Christ here in, in uh, Fresno, Texas, and we encourage you to come and physically sit and visit fellowship and worship with the members here at Agape Church of Christ. So until next time, we want to thank you for your time and attendance, and we'll see you in the next episode of The Place Where It Is Written. Amen. We welcome you, our guests, to Agape Church of Christ. We're glad you're here. Please come again. We sing and praise the Lord and the Word of God. Is we welcome you to Agape. We're glad you're here. Amen. Let's keep this.